everyone. Space. So, in the last couple of years, um, we've heard a lot the big German word Verkehrswende, or as you, if you would literally translate it, traffic turnaround, um, or what most people would just call sustainable mobility. But what sustainable in what way, or for whom? What do we mean by that? Um, I think a lot of people would say, well, it's getting rid of fossil fuels, right? It's easy. We take cars and we change the combustion engine for an electrical engine, and that is what we mean by sustainable mobility. Or is it about incorporating new technologies like artificial intelligence or Internet of Things by making our cities and our cars more connected, smarter, and being more efficient with the space we're using and being able to basically put more um, in the same amount of space? Or, which a lot of people will tell you, is it about saving the planet? Yes, 100%. You can't argue with that. It's definitely about saving the planet, right? Because um, sustainable basically means scalable. And scalable means growing a system, scaling a system without um, exhausting finite resources and without breaking the system, right? And, well, our planet definitely is a scarce resource. Our CO2 budget is a scarce resource, and we're exhausting it really, really quickly. So, absolutely, it's about saving the planet um, because fossil fuels and our planet is a scarce resource. But today I want to talk about something else, about another aspect, about space also being a scarce resource, not necessarily globally or on a global level, but definitely in our cities. In our cities, space is a very scarce resource because 68% of people will live in cities in 2050. So urbanization is definitely one of these meta, meta or mega trends we've been seeing in the last century, we're seeing it in this century, and it's accelerating even faster. And when you think 2050, well, that's, that's 30 years away, what really blew me away when I heard it is that today, 80% of people in North America or in the United States already live in urban areas. And in Europe, that number is 70% of people that already live in cities. That means when we talk about sustainable mobility, we're really talking about the space in our cities. And why are people flocking um, into cities? Oops, sorry. Yeah, because cities facilitate what some people call serendipity. So it's, it's more or less random connections. It's things that happen that were maybe unforeseen, things that are being created through density, things that are being created through um, unforeseen connections. And cities really, really facilitate that. Cities facilitate communication um, and the free flow of information and people. And where that is really happening is on the streets. The streets is where information, ideas, goods, businesses, and people really come together. And the streets is also the place where we play and explore kids, but also older people. So it's, 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 it's really that space that is needed to, to create and to fulfill the promise of cities. For that, cities need space. Uh, you need the space for all of that to happen and for cities to, to fulfill their promise. And when cities were originally designed, or let's say when the big European metropolises and, and US, big US cities were redesigned about um, 100 years ago, there was ample space. You see big streets, large squares, um, a mixed mode of transport, so to speak, or different types of uh, things on the street, horse carriages, streetcars, people playing on the street, kids playing on the street. So, that was built in, that was by design. But then what happened was, over the last hundred years, cars have completely and utterly exhausted this resource over the last 100 years. And they've literally hijacked our cities. And now, don't get me wrong, as you might know, um, Spin um, is a fully owned entity of Ford Motor Company. So um, I'm, I'm not saying cars are great because of that. I'm saying cars are actually great when they were invented, and, and, and um, I truly believe that. So cars, when they originally came around, 
they, they were what made people truly mobile for the first time. It gave them access to the next market, it gave them access to the next city. It was actually a big equalizer once cars became um, more uh, democratized and affordable. Um, but then at some point in our cities, it reached a tipping point and it started being um, not an agent of inclusion or access anymore, but actually quite the opposite, isolation. Um, it was more the, um, um, uh, what, what happened and, and it gave people less access to, to these sort of meeting points. So it, it, it changed over the last couple of decades. It really changed in the wrong direction. Um, and some of this was quite systematic. So here, this is actually not a picture of Berlin. This is a picture of Los Angeles. Um, and Los Angeles actually at some point 100 years ago had the biggest streetcar system in the world. It was really designed around streetcars. And then it was systematically dismantled over 100 years and were literally highways put on top of the streetcar system. So the infamous Los Angeles um, uh, highway system that we all know as a car city, um, it was actually put on top of the, of the streetcar tracks. And, and this was a systematic dismantling with you know, quite a bit of help <laughs> of the car industry um, and, and their lobbyists. So we've systematically redesigned cities. Um, and the car has won the competition for space for now. And I, I love this picture because it really shows if you take away the space that's being used by cars, what is left of the city. I think this is very, very powerful. Um, and in fact, in Berlin, even though Berlin has the lowest density of cars per capita of all the big German cities, still 58% of the public thoroughfare, so basically the, the space that is available for people to move around, um, is occupied by cars. And even worse, 19, so almost 20%, one-fifth of that is used for parking. For parking, cars that move on average one hour a day with 23 hours where they just stand still. Um, so this is, this is the famous Gehzeug by um, Professor Knoflacher, a um, um, famous uh, Austrian um, mobility researcher who already a couple of decades ago showed this, which basically demonstrates the bad ratio that a car has from the physical footprint, the footprint of space that the car takes in the city, versus what is actually being transported. In most cases, one person. So if you take a busload of people and you put them all in cars, you already have a traffic jam, right? And with one parking space, in a city, on one parking space in a city, you can park 10 bicycles um, or even more, 10 to 12 e-scooters. So that brings us to that concept of the footprint, the footprint of a means of transport, the footprint of a vehicle. And that brings us ultimately to what um, a lot of people these days call um, micromobility. And some people will define micro-ability around the weight of the vehicle. They say it's less than 500 uh, kilograms. And other people define it by being electric. Um, so definitely no combustion engine, but an electric engine. And both of that is true. But what I would really focus on with micro-mobility is, is, is the much lower footprint, right? So here you see the extreme, a one wheel that transports one person. So just a wheel this size transports this a person in the same way like a Rolls Royce Phantom. Well, well not, not in the same way, but like <laughs> in, um, transports a person, right? So it's definitely the, the, more favorable, uh, the more favorable ratio here. And this is why micromobility over the last one or two years has, has really taken off um, on a global level. Um, McKinsey says that in 2030, already 15% of all passenger trips in cities will be done using micromobility services, and that does not even include individually owned bikes. Then this ratio will be um, even higher. And we've really seen this at spin. We've seen the transition from um, this being sort of a, a fun and, and novel 
thing to try out, a novelty, like one or two years ago, people were really eager to try it out and thought it was fun. But now during, during COVID and during this crazy year of 2020, we've really seen a shift and we've really seen an acceleration of the use of micromobility. Um, we've seen uh, in the US, we've operated all the way through the lockdown, through the har harshest lockdown in spring and through COVID. We've, we've had 50,000 kilometers traveled by essential workers, people, bus drivers getting to their bus and nurses getting to the hospital um, uh, uh, during COVID. And then we've had um, 50% over 50% longer rides than pre-COVID, and that's actually sustained. So now, even when the worst lockdown is over, in these markets we see 50% longer rides than before, and we see 90% of our markets that we're operating in more rides than before. So when first COVID hit, everybody thought this would be, you know, um, like almost a death sentence for for transport for micro mobility. The opposite is true, and all of um, all of micro mobility companies are actually publishing similar numbers. So this really has pushed it into being the new normal um, and not just being sort of a, an interesting uh, novelty that I write for fun on the weekend. So when micromobility is kind of the, the carrot, the accessible and easy to use alternative to cars, then we also need to talk a little bit about the stick. And the stick basically being economic disincentives for taking up public space. Because there's another aspect to all of this, and this is that um, residential living in big cities has become extremely expensive, and it comes at a premium. And this is a discussion we're seeing in all big cities um, where there's not necessarily enough affordable space for more people to move into cities and to fulfill that promise of inclusion and access that the cities have. So that's a big problem. And when you think about it, it's crazy that an average parking space is 12 square meters. That is two square meters more than the recommended size of a children's child's bedroom, um, which is pretty insane when you think about it. And equally insane is that people in Munich, in Berlin, in Hamburg, in the most desirable areas in Germany, let alone abroad, where, you know, cities like London or Paris are even much more expensive. In, for prime real estate, renting prime real estate in Germany, we're willing to pay you know, up to 20 euros per square meter. And then the car that sits in front of the very building costs two, 20 euros 40 for two years in Berlin. And that's not acceptable. We need to disincentivize the use of public space for private parking in a major way. So it needs to become a lot more expensive. If I rent a private parking spot in a big German city today, I'm paying hundreds of euros per month, um, and then just using public space for parking is virtually free. So I think that's a, that's a big, big shift that needs to happen. Um, because space is at a premium, right? And big, needs to cost premium. So we are incentivizing electric cars because they have a lower carbon footprint, which is great. But a big electric car still takes up a lot more space than a small electric car. So I think that we need to factor in, in cities, into the vehicle tax, we need to, to, we need to figure out a way to um, make big cost more. If I drive a big car and I take more space from you privately, that should be factored in and it shouldn't be just a factor of the, um, um, of the carbon footprint, but it needs to be a factor of how much space do I need for myself. Um, and when we do that, then we can really fulfill the promise of the cities and go back to cities where, you know, it's, it, it, it's people first and where, where we fulfill that promise and, and people can come together and enjoy the street and the public life, where we stay local, travel in smaller radiuses, um, but in a more meaningful way, rediscover our neighborhood um, and make meaningful connections just around where we live. Um, and we can get to enjoy redesigned cities like this is the Friedrichstraße last weekend. It was redesigned in a way that it is now um, 
um, uh, putting people and, and micro mobility first and gives just a great space to hang out. So let's give cities the space they need to breathe and let's give them the space to fulfill their promise. Thank you. <laughs>